Right, so it's three o'clock and welcome to the second of two online seminar series that MD UK is holding this afternoon as we are launching our Muscles Matter online seminar series, Living with a Muscle Wasting Condition in 2020 and Beyond. My name's Kate Adcock, I'm the Director of Research and Innovation and I'll be chairing this session this afternoon. Very warm welcome to those of you who are joining us for the first time and welcome back to any of those of you who were with us for the SMA session earlier on today. Um, in this series we have 12 seminars um, between now and the end of October. And we're really fixating on exploring what it's like to live with a muscle wasting condition in, in these unprecedented times. Six of the sessions are um, related to conditions, specific conditions, which are aligned to the various awareness days, weeks and months that are happening at the moment. It's currently SMA Awareness Month, for example. Um, and the remaining six sessions are looking at a range of topics that are relevant to anyone living with a muscle wasting condition. Um, and the full list of the um, seminars and the link for you to go to if you want to um, is join in any of the other sessions should be appearing on your screen um, any moment now if you haven't already seen it. Um, so just thinking about why, why are we doing this? Well, we're holding these seminars virtually because obviously because of COVID, we are unable to meet you face to face. And normally in the course of a year, we would have a number of activities and a number of days where we would be meeting you. Um, we have our patient information days, family fun days, national conferences and, and muscle groups. However, although we can't see you face to face, we can we can meet you through the these virtual events and we are still available for you to, to help you if you need us. And we have a helpline which remains available to anyone affected by muscle wasting conditions. So do please contact us if you have any questions or you are in need of support. Um, we can help you with information and, and point you in the direction of others who, who um, can support you also. So as you can see, the number and email address are on your screen now. And should you need to call us, our number is 0800 652 6352. Or you can email us at um, info at musculodystrophyuk.org. So now focusing on today's seminar, this is on um, thinking about the living in a world with COVID-19, which obviously we have all been doing now for several months. Um, we've assembled a really great panel to look at this topic from a variety of angles, and we really want to use this time to learn more from you about your key concerns at this time, which will help shape our work over the coming months and guide where we focus our attention. But before we get to the panel, just a bit of housekeeping to, to make sure that we're all um, aware of what's what. Um, there is a, a Q&A functionality on the Zoom um, call, so please do take advantage of that. If you um, want to, you can, you can submit a question through that functionality. We will do our best to answer it today. It might be that um, we, we don't get to it, but we'll try and answer things um, in the fullness of time. And again, if you've got comments and, and things you want to, to raise, um, it will help us as we shape our work as, as we move forward um, during the, the pandemic. Um, we also have some questions that have been submitted in advance and we will try and um, address those as well. Um, we will pick up those questions that you submit that you write down rather than um, zooming into your homes individually to, to get you to ask the questions um, with the camera in your face. So fear not, this, is, this will all be done um, through the, the Zoom functionality. Um, and just one final thing, this, this um, session is being recorded and um, will be available through our website in the next 24 hours or so. So finally, let's meet the panel. Um, I'd just like to start by welcoming everyone and thanking them to, for spending time with us this afternoon. I'll introduce each of them and then um, get each of them to say a few words before we, we open up to the, the questions. So first of all, I'd like to introduce um, Sue Manning, who's a neuromuscular specialist care advisor based at Leeds Teaching Hospital NHS Trust. Sue was instrumental in the early development of the paediatric neuromuscular service there, and she now works as a specialist care advisor in a dedicated multidisciplinary service. Her current role entails offering advice and support to families affected by neuromuscular conditions 
from the time of diagnosis and right through to that transition into adult services. Um, she liaises with a number of other professionals from across different sectors, including um, health sector, education and social care. And Sue is also um, a member of our MD UK Services Development Committee. Moving on, in the top right-hand corner of my screen anyway, is um, Chloe Ball Hopkins. Um, Chloe works and studies in the um, me media industry and lives with uh, a muscle wasting condition. And she um, blogged for us um, about her experiences of shielding recently, which is, is really fantastic of her. Um, and in a virtual collaboration, which is quite a new thing, I guess, for, for all of us to work with, um, she co-designed um, shielding badges that were made available through the um, MD UK website earlier this month. And the collaboration was with um, another MD UK supporter called Kieran Sales from the Action for Alfie um, Family Fund. Um, these these um, shielding badges, and I'm sure she'll talk a bit more about this later, are basically designed to allow people who, who want to, to, to wear them um, to alert people that they want to have that extra space and to remind people of the, the social distancing. And to date, we've had well over 3,600 downloads from the website. So it's been a very popular endeavour. So um, it's really wonderful and, and great that we've had this virtual collaboration. Um, Ella Wright is, is another member of the panel. Um, she's a membership officer for National Voices, which is a coalition of charities that stands for people being in control of their health and care. Ella joined National Voices as a membership officer in 2019, and she supports work on many of their projects, such as on waiting times, integrating mental and physical health and administration in the NHS. During lockdown, however, she's been helping on much of their new work, including um, their website called Our COVID Voices, which she'll talk to us about later on. And this is a platform that's intended to gather the experiences of people, particularly those living with long term health conditions during this unprecedented time of the pandemic. Um, Rob Burley is um, MD UK Director of Campaigns, Care and Support. He um, joined the, the charity in December 2018 and leads our services and campaigning work, which includes the helpline and advocacy service. And finally, Dr. Jatin Padney is from the um, Queen Square Centre for Neuromuscular Diseases, where he's a clinical psychologist. And um, Jatin, if there's any more you would like to add, um, feel free to, to add any more. No, that's it. Other than, uh, you know, I've been working in neuromuscular services since... Uh, for a long time now, maybe uh, over a decade. So within mm. the complex care service as well as uh, uh, in, the, in other services. So um, I've been doing a lot of work with people, uh, you know, in general, but also around this COVID situation that we all find ourselves in. Thank you very much. So that's an introduction to the panel. Fantastic. Thank you very much, everyone, for being here. Um, Rob, I guess it would be useful if you could kick off a little bit to start out by sort of saying how MD UK initially reacted at the start of the pandemic and, and sort of reflect on some of the issues that people have been raising with us over the last few months. Thanks, Kay. And yeah, as I was reflecting sort of back and proposed for this and listening to your remarks, it made me realise just, just how much the world has changed. I think last time Sue and I were on a panel together, we were in a, a large conference centre in Heathrow. Um, and, and Kate, I've kind of over, over the last few months got used to having to bug you on Teams or on the phone rather than just wander over to your desk. So we've, we've definitely had to adapt quite a lot. So um, I think kind of I'll sort of break it down to sort of three areas really in terms of um, how the UK responded initially to the to the sort of COVID nineteen and kind of what we've seen come through through the community. So I think the, the first thing we we really sort of did. As, as we were navigating the impact on us as an organisation, which there's plenty of information about on our, our website, was sort of really try and ensure that we were the sort of centre point for kind of information and support for people, um, particularly in the very early stages of, of the pandemic. And we did a, sort of a, a number of things to, to ensure that we, we could do that. So the first thing we did was um, very quickly dedicated a section of the website to um, interpreting the guidance that was coming through um, from central government, from um, other groups, from professional bodies. and I'm sure people can remember back in sort of February, March, April, that actually that, that guidance was was regularly changing and, and often didn't align with each other. So I think for us, it was a question of 
we you know we viewed our role as interpreting the guidance and trying to bring it all together in one place um which which often meant changing it up to three times a week which was sort of not that not not a kind of um stress-free time but that really sort of paid off in terms of how people have used that so um we've had over well, you know, nearly twenty five thousand kind of unique page views and at one point it was sort of ten percent of all the traffic going through our our website um as well as providing that kind of written information um, and you know, trying to keep that relevant to everyone wherever they were in the UK and whatever their situation, we also ensured that the helpline stayed open. Um, and that was that was really sort of important for us to sort of make sure that people could stay in contact with us over the phone or over email. Um, and I'm sure um, other charities would have seen this sort of sim similar um, impact. But in the first two months of the pandemic, call, number of calls and emails we were taking rose by 35%. Um, and and, and in total, about 40% of the calls that we, we were taking and, and emails were related directly to COVID in those first few months. So it was a real kind of, not only a, a volume, but we had to kind of learn us, ourselves and, and really interpret sort of guidance and issues. And really in the first stage of the, of the pandemic, that was, that was the key. People were just simply asking questions about what impact will COVID have on me due to my neuromuscular condition. Um, and then we started to get questions about shielding as kind of that became a new word that we're now all familiar with, but certainly I'd never heard of. And, you know, along with things like furlough, things that this year have entered the, um, entered our, our vocabulary. Um, and it's interesting, kind of interesting to reflect um, as we move into the discussion, but I, I, over sort of the past few months, people started to um, ask us more about kind of return to, return to kind of accessing services, return to education, issues with, with employment, that kind of thing. Um, a key role we played was um, coordinating um, with the sort of neuromuscular community. I can see in the in the participant list of, of several people we, we work with, which is really great to see see you. Um, we sort of coordinated nine neuromuscular charities, um, and, and we did that because we formed a, a group of four clinicians, four neuromuscular consultants, to help us ensure that all of the information and advice we gave out was was accurate. Because we realised that was that was really going to be key in terms of interpreting the the the, the um, uh, the guidance was coming through and as knowledge of COVID really grew I think it was in our earlier session just now we, we spoke about how um, just the, the response for people with SMA has changed drastically as we've learned more about the impact it can have on people with different conditions and so at the beginning it was all around sort of safety and, and now maybe we're looking at more how can we um, become more integrated so forming that that panel was really important and therefore by us coordinating with the nine charities we were able to control the email traffic that was going to those clinicians because I think uh, I think they were working um, if not 32 hour days, certainly 24, 12 hour days. So we, we, we that was a key role we played. Um, I think the second thing we did um, was really try to identify where we could best represent, where we were needed to represent people living with a muscle wasting condition. And I kind of, we, there were a couple of key areas. So right, right at the beginning, there was a lot of um, concern around things like the coronavirus bill. So that was the bill that gave um, uh, the powers that, um, to, for local authorities in particular to respond to the pandemic and there was concern that that might erode at some of the sort of social care provision that, that people could 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 receive um so we we combined with other charities to kind of ensure that there was a light on that um it, it, it the initial nice guidance that came out caused some concern that people with underlying conditions like a neuromuscular condition may not have received treatment in in, in the sort of case of really acute cases of, of, of covid and, and thankfully we didn't end up seeing that that the NHS being completely overrun, which but people may remember right at the beginning was a real fear that, that people, people had. They'd be interested to hear kind of Sue, Sue and Jason's thoughts on that a bit later on. Um, then there were some sort of specific issues um, around concerns about access to things like ventilation equipment, sort of linked to that um, preparation for a potential kind of surge um, of, of, of cases. Um, and I think kind of something that we're, we're still involved in, um, and I think is, is really key is, is, is shielding. Um, and, and we, really kind of people's experience changing of, of shielding and first of all you know encouraging people to understand what that meant and to help interpret kind of why they needed to do that and kind of what that meant in practice providing resources um in particular you know, chloe's badges that she helped co-design so that people felt were able to be a bit more empowered about kind of what they what how they could live with it and and a current focus really for us is on the employment so as people are coming out of shielding so shielding has, has technically been over since you know since the start of august but actually we know there are a large number of people who are still very concerned about returning to the workplace and feeling safe to, to, to do that. So we're still working on that in conjunction with a wide number of, of charities, not just neuromuscular charities. And, and throughout, we've tried to engage wherever we can. So we were, we were part of a sort of cross-government work, work group of cross-government workshops with a 
about sort of 30 to 40 other charities representing a range of conditions and, and national voices were, were part of that, that, that coalition as well. And then kind of finally, it, also just always trying to keep an eye on the longer term impact. And that's kind of what we're moving to now, I think, and partly what will, will be great to explore in this, in this session, kind of what, several months on now from the start of the, of the pandemic, where, what, what is the community really concerned about in the main and kind of what are the issues? So again, people coming out of shielding, people returning to their neuromuscular appointments, that kind of thing. Um, and then the absolute final thing we did was try and keep an eye on kind of, sounds a tweet term now, but business as usual. So for us, you know, a key part of what we do that we've explored in the previous seminar is um, ensure that people can access treatments as they become available. And that, and that hasn't stopped. There was a hiatus um, as nice focused on the, on the pandemic. But Kate, you and I have got a busy autumn because I think we counted there are sort of five or six treatments going through the nice process, sort of starting from September. So we've what we've tried to do is balance the need to respond to COVID and represent the community, but also make sure that we don't um, drop the ball on the other sort of crucial work that, that, that we do, which has at times been, been quite a stressful experience. But yeah, hopefully that's helped give, give an overview of kind of where, where we're at. Thank you. I nearly did the thing that happens to everyone at some point during this thing and started talking while I was on mute, but caught myself in time. Um, so Sue, to, looking to you now, thinking of some of the things that Rob sort of touched on there was sort of having to adjust to uh, neuro, neuromuscular services being delivered in a new way. Can you tell us a little bit about how the service in Leeds has responded and, and how some of the issues that, that Rob outlined perhaps mirror what you're experiencing in your interactions with families? Um, yeah, uh, well, I think the initial response, um, being in health and being in a, an acute, large teaching hospital at Leeds, which is where I'm based, um, the initial response was about um, looking at services um, and redistribution of services, really, because we were um, expecting um, a huge influx of patients that were affected by COVID and seriously ill patients, because we'd looked at, obviously, um, Italy, Spain and their experiences. So it was all about, as we, we know, um, everybody knows, saving the NHS, preparing the NHS. So as a, as, as, a, as a team, there was um, uncertainty to begin with as, as how our team would be affected. Um, in children's services, we were very lucky um, in that um, all of our staff, that included the therapists um, and the nursing staff, myself and all our clinicians, we were basically ring fenced and said, the neuromuscular service will stay a priority. You will continue working as per normal, but in a different way. Um, we weren't sure to begin with because some staff were, were redeployed in other areas. And, and our experience here was especially the district general hospitals. Um, a lot of therapy staff were redeployed. So OTs and physios that we've been working with closely were redeployed into different services. Some of their children's therapists were redeployed into adult services. Um, because it was very much the focus on adult patients coming in, trying to um, get those adult patients that were fit for discharge, discharged home quickly and, and efficiently to free up spaces and beds for the anticipated influx of, of patients that we, 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 were, we were expecting. So it was it was a difficult time. Um, there was, and, and, and I have to say, I think here um, we were all kept very well informed. Um, there was daily briefings, but it, it was an uncertain time. But as as a neuromuscular team, we um, we then very quickly went into how we going to support our families. Um, we very quickly secured. The, the knowledge and the fact that those children with SMA that were being treated by Nusi Nursing were protected and that that would carry on. And Dr. Childs got agreement very quickly that that treatment would not be interrupted um, and would continue as the oncology treatments were continuing for the children in oncology. So that was, that was a big piece of work to make sure that all families knew that would continue. Um, our clinics, face-to-face -face clinics were cancelled very quickly. All our domiciliary work, our visits out that any of the therapists, nurses, myself did, they were cancelled. Um, so then we started to look quickly at strategies to support families and then starting to look at new technologies. So it was video conferencing, um, attend anywhere 
using those platforms and initially it was mostly telephone clinics and support. We very quickly went through the priority list. We went through the whole of our patient database to prioritize those that we felt would be at the at significant risk from COVID, updated all their all patients' respiratory care plans in conjunction with them and steroid care plans for those um, children um, and young people that were using steroids. And we wanted to be clear with updating those plans that if, if any of our patients became unwell and they, they needed access to treatment, they would be good, given full access to treatment because I think that was one of the worries in the early stages that, that we, were, we, we weren't sure what the numbers would be like. Um, thankfully, now we're out, uh, you know, we're coming out, you know, months down the line. We didn't have the, the, the issues that we anticipated, but we didn't know at that, that stage. It was all unknown. So one of the big things was preparing and making sure that, that, that care plans and working with palliative care plan, uh, our palliative care service as well, that those older young men with DMD had an opportunity to go through their care plans, put what they wanted to be in place. So if they did become well, they would be given the full treatment necessary. Um, so it was it was a an in, very interesting time. And then looking at working from home more, that the hospital wanted to reduce the number of footfall of staff that were were, were not necessary. So um, quite quickly, myself and my colleague, um, our nurse, started to work from home remotely more. We had all the kit already. Fortunately, we were we were partly doing that anyway. Um, so I think. I think that was that was our initial reaction, and, and our, that 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 went on and through. And then it was also to reassure families that we were open for not as normal. We were still offering a neuromuscular service, and if they had worries and concerns that were not COVID related, that were were related to their condition, we needed to know that there was a reluctance on families. Understandably, they. The, some families didn't want to come to the hospital. Um, we had a number of fam, um, young people where we actually wanted to start them on non-invasive um, ventilation, but families were reluctant to come over the threshold because it was perceived that we were at a higher risk. Um, and also the issue about carers and family being able to stay with 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 um, with. Their, their children, young people, and, and, and for adults still, it's the same now. Visiting is still very limited, and we're in areas where there's more local lockdown where visiting is, is limited. And so that there's still a, there is a reluctance and still a reluctance perhaps to seek medical help when it's needed. And that was one thing we were really, we wanted to make sure that people were aware that we were still here. Um, so that was our, our initial reaction you know, sort of start of it. We're coming, moving forward now and looking at a different way in which we're working. We are seeing people face to face. Um, again, um, within the clinic situation, we've done some today, um, not as many clinics. The clinics look very different. We are, uh, to access the services is very different. We have to wear PPE, which is a very different way of working. Um, and we are starting to do home visits again, um, but we've, we're using the technology and I think the technology will continue to be used for, 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 for a long time, actually. And for some families, they said it's been great because we've not had to travel, you know, and try and find a parking space in Leeds, which is a, which is a, a nightmare. So actually some reviews, we will continue because that's good practice and we've learned from that. Um, and it's a better way of working. So from some, you know, there have been some lots of issues, but there's also some learning points and positive things that I think as we go forward that we will change the way we maybe deliver healthcare and that there will be some advantages to that. Brilliant, super, thank you. Just a reminder to, to the um, participants who are at home, wherever you may be, um, do feel free to, to add questions to the Q&A function. If you kind of wiggle the mouse around, you'll see a Q&A um, little box at the bottom of the screen. Um, and do feel free to ask questions um, of our panellists. But before we, we we'll, we'll collate those questions, but before we move on to any of those, Chloe, um, thinking about your experiences, we'd really like to hear more about you know your how shielding was for you and how you kind of came to the idea of having the, the shielding badges. 
Shielding's been an interesting time. It was a roller coaster. When I worked out initially that I would be under that category of people staying at home, I was all over the place of working out what that meant. I was doing a degree my first year of it. I was just about six weeks into working as a support worker at the college where I was studying. And I didn't know how any of that was going to work from home because at that time, everyone else was still in normally. So it was an adjustment period for a few weeks. Um, luckily, I lived with my grandparents in an annex at there. So my nan got the same letter having the same condition as me. So I knew I wasn't going to be on my own for the period of time. But it was a strange adaption period. And then very quickly, actually, once I realised how I could do things from here, I got myself into a routine and found it quite simple. Instead of commuting into Bristol every morning, I would just go from my bed to the dining room table and set up camp for the day. And it worked quite well. And I think that's just because I've made myself busy between the work as well. I was just ignoring, really, the fact that I couldn't go and see my mum or my friends or my partner. So I just switched that off, which I don't think was necessarily healthy. I've learned that now, but it was my way of dealing with it initially. Uh, it was when it got towards the end of the 12 weeks, so we were starting to wonder what was going to happen because it didn't look like it was going to be safe at that point to go back to whatever normal was at that point. So we, we knew it was going to be longer than the 12 weeks, but... I don't know where the time's gone now, really. It kind of all just blurred. I started enjoying my summer once I handed in my last piece of work and I finished work for the summer. I enjoyed the weather because at that point it was beautiful. Got a lovely garden, made the most of outdoor time. But actually it's been since August where I found it's been amazing just having that little bit of time at other places. So I'm really limiting what I do and where I go. I'm not doing shops, pubs, restaurants, but I do go down to my parents' house because they've been shielding down there too. They live just around the corner. I've been to my friend's house, but only after she told me how much she bleached and deep cleaned and dettled and everything. So I'm really restricting what I do even now, even with the shielding lanyard, which I just sat there and said, how are people going to know to stay two meters from me because I could see very clearly from social media and the news and from what people said were saying that people weren't sticking to two meters and that's their choice but for me I wouldn't feel safe going somewhere where people did come closer and how do you tell them because by the time they're close enough to hear you say stay away that they're already within your space so I just sat there scratched my head thought about it got in contact with a few people within MD UK and found out luckily a few other people had had a similar idea and then the ball kind of got rolling from there and when you said the numbers of people who've been downloading them earlier I didn't know that and I'm so glad that people are utilizing that but what next I don't know so when you say in there about what happens next with shielding I'd really like to know I'm supposed to go back to work and things soon at the moment I can work from home study from home but yeah, what next? Is it safe? Is it not safe? It's a really big decision as to what happens next, really. Sure, sure. No, absolutely. Well, thank you for sharing that. It's a sort of very personal thing to, to, to share with us. So thank you. And, and you sort of talk, touched there on sort of what it felt like to, to sort of suddenly be, you know, not seeing family, close family, and, and the sort of the, the mental psychological side of things. So Jayton, you know building on that there's been a lot of discussion really ever since the beginning of, of the pandemic about the impact on mental health um and what kind of things are you sort of seeing that people living with muscle wasting conditions are raising with you and i guess what are your concerns and thoughts for the for the months ahead you are on mute emma can you unmute Jay i'm back. Sorry, I'm, I'm back sorry technology um i mean i think the first thing uh, you know we have to put in the room i guess is just the impact that this covid thing has had on everyone i mean you know it's to try and get your head around this event uh, i mean i can't i still can't i still don't know how you describe it uh how are we going to describe it in the future how do we describe it to our kids our families you know um i mean it's it's incomprehensible, right? That's, and it's important to acknowledge that's what we're all dealing with. I mean, everyone is grappling with this kind of existentialist shift that's happened in our lives, right? Within a matter of uh, weeks, would you say? You know, when we first heard about this place called Wuhan that none of us had ever heard about, had we? I don't know, I've never heard about it. Uh, you know, 
uh, this this thing that happened, you know, to a bunch of people there, not realizing how big that place is in the first place, to uh, lockdown, to you know, furloughs, job losses, school closing. I mean, it's 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 incredible. I mean, it's it's incredible that we're in this situation, even right. To find so that's what we're all grappling with, right? All of us. Um, so I think that's the first thing. And then how do you understand that from a psychological point of view? You know, where, where do you find your kind of ground or your base? Um, and actually, I mean, the scale is one thing, but in terms of unexpected events that have um, a huge impact on people, actually, you know, there, there is stuff out there. You know, we have actually, as, as individuals, we've dealt with stuff. And, you know, if you've lived with a, a health condition, you're very familiar with unexpected things that are unpredictable that happen out of the blue and that have profound effects on your lives you're very familiar with that stuff right but also as as a as a, as a group of a species uh, you know we're used to things happening in our lives right things that are uh, um, unprecedented right so i suppose from my point of view you know it's been looking at it um you know what 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 is this psychological approach and what what can we expect um and I think there's two kind of, uh, the, the, the model I've been following, there's two approach, two kind of waves to it, really. One is thinking about people in, in these kind of disaster situations and what happens, right? Uh, and I think there's lots of useful information out there uh, with the emphasis on uh, not so much psychotherapy. The first you know, thing is people think, you know, there's this going to be this uh, mental health issue. People need psychotherapy, need you know, anxiety, PTSD and all those sorts of things. And it's not. The message is actually, it's, uh, I think the phrase is um, psychological first aid. You know, with core principles is looking after, making sure resources are in place, addressing stresses uh, and supporting individuals, addressing things like isolation, uh, loss of network, all those sorts of things. Re-establishing routines, maintaining routines, all those kind of good things that uh, maintain people's well-being. So a lot of the work that I've been doing is around just that, you know, helping people kind of identify where the stresses are and what can they what can they do about it um, and then running parallel with that uh, well actually I'll stay with that and it's interesting when you look at the literature they talk about people talk about four stages uh, I think or three or four stages uh, so you have the initial you know first uh, when the event happens then you have this kind of heroic phase where everyone's uh, has this kind of altruistic we're all going to pull together, you know, we're going to save and rescue and da da da, da uh, followed by a kind of honeymoon phase where people are, are getting support and so on. And then there's this longer phase, which is the disillusionment phase, you know, where people start to realize actually things have changed, the world has changed, and this is the new normal, which is interesting. That's the phrase that keeps coming up, isn't it? The new normal. Um, so I was trying to place myself, as well as the people I work with, and as well as the organize, organization where we are on one on that and to understand that actually is a process and at the end of it is this kind of well, what do they call it they call it a restorative phase I don't, I'm not sure what that means but I think it means adjustment to and making that step finally you know recognizing things have changed and what what how you fit in into that new place which a bit is like, it's a bit like what you know other people have said here right um, so it's important to think about it like that that we're all grappling with this uh, and there's a huge amount of loss you know masses of loss going on uh, for all of us, right, uh, that we're, we're dealing with. Uh, for for the neuromuscular population, I think there's some specific themes that have come up, so I'm happy to kind of share those with you now, if you'd like. Or, um, but I suppose it's things like, um, I mean, I think first thing is we, we have to remember as organizations, services, and so on, is um, that the, the individual with the neuromuscular condition uh, gets, you know, from like health teams and, and other teams, uh, there's there's kind of direct support and indirect support, I think. There's the direct support, which is where you provide information, you do the health checks and all that sort of stuff. But I think we also provide a kind of, not an indirect, a more subtle kind of support, which is the emotional support of being there, of reassuring, of holding, of containing. And I think with COVID, what's happened possibly is, you know, as services have changed and reorganized and tried to work out new ways of working, some of that has disappeared or reduced, I think, you know, and I think what we're all doing now is trying to catch up and put those things in place, right? But I think that's that's possibly what individuals have felt, you know, that absence of, of these kind of rocks, if you like, which is, you know, uh, muscular dystrophy, it's all the charities, it's all the health services, it's all the other agencies that are involved, as well as work, as well as education, right? As much as we hate our colleagues, 
or going to work or go, you know, even going on public transport. I mean, who, who likes it? No one likes it. But when you talk to people and they say, you know, the things they miss is that conversation they have with that guy or that person when they're going off to the tube or the person in the shop or, you know, their colleague, the one that they don't really like talking to, but, you know, actually enjoy saying hello to. You know, so that's all those kind of absences, I think, which people are noticing, right? I think um, the isolation is, is, is key, you know, as well. The sense of isolation and the need uh, or the perce perceived idea that you're isolated. And again, it's this, it's this um, sense that services and other people have kind of distanced. Uh, so as people, as other people kind of return back to normal, I think our neuromuscular patients have felt left behind or felt like a second kind of um, a reoccurrence of this kind of loss, if you like, you know, they'd be left behind, other people are going back and I'm stuck here, you know, and services aren't open for me, you know, like swimming pools and stuff like that, you know, why is it open for everyone else? Where's the, the, where's the uh, swimming pools where you have access, they're not open. And so, you know, it's a double whammy, I think, right? Um, I'm trying to think what else, uh, what other things have come up. I think those are the kind of key. So I think it's really important for us uh, as organizations and people who support to really think about where the stresses are and when you're kind of thinking about individuals and who to help important to think you know uh, about who might be more vulnerable and there's there's information out there you know there are people who might be more vulnerable who may be less well resourced and I think that's the key right it's about supporting building resources but also encouraging because this is really important for other you know the individuals to problem solve and work things out for themselves so again, the question about shielding and, and work and when to go back, you know, to me, it feels like it's, it, it is a, it's a question for the individual. We have to support them to make that decision as well, right? And, and, and work out what they need to do. Right? Um, I think in terms of my service, what we've specifically done within the neuromuscular uh, service, uh, psychology service uh, is, is open up more clinics and sessions for people. So uh, consultants from uh, across the neuromuscular services have been sort of referring people in uh, who they feel need support or want, uh, uh, need a place to kind of talk about some of the things that are going on. And as I said, my, my approach hasn't been therapy. I haven't been doing kind of focused CBT on anxiety or depression. Uh, if I felt there is a need for something, then I've obviously made referrals and put things in place, but it's been much more about kind of problem solving, working out where the stresses are and stuff like that. So good old-fashioned stuff that I think a lot of people can do, right? Um, we've, uh, I've tried to address the isolation issue as well. So in terms of, uh, and this is something we, we, you know, maybe as shielding, I don't know where shielding is at actually at the moment, like, you know, where are people with it on shielding? But um, certainly for my young patients, so I run a group for young patients, um, and we were meeting monthly before COVID, uh, and we've actually increased the frequency of the, those sessions at, at their kind of request and made it much more social as well. But we talk very much about COVID. You know, the conversation that's coming up is, when do I start going out? I feel really nervous. I feel really anxious about going out. Those sorts of things. So I think, you know, there's things like that that we can do uh, before we get to the, the kind of PTSD, psychotherapy and those sorts of things. But, you know, obviously you need to um, identify people who really are struggling and, and understand when, when to refer someone on. Um, yeah, I think that's it. I think those are the sorts of things that we go. But yeah. thank you, thank you. So okay. we've started to get some questions coming through. So do do keep do keep um, thinking about things. If if what people are talking about sort of chimes with what what you're thinking and what you're feeling, you can also leave um, your questions or comments anonymously should you wish to. Um, just finally, though, looking to our panel. Um, Ella has some, some slides to talk us through a little bit about um, the, the work that um, our COVID voices has been, national voices have been, have been carrying out. I imagine that some of the things that you've heard already this afternoon, um, Ella, sort of chime across um, other long-term health conditions. So maybe if you could, you could tell us a little bit about that, that'd be great. Yeah, it's really resonated. Um, and I suppose, so we have 160 member charities from really, really big charities to smaller ones. Um, and we kind of work with them to strengthen the voice of people in the health and social care system. Um, and so like many of our members, our, our work quickly shifted to focus on responding to COVID uh, with the aim to, to advocate for those with long-term conditions and those shielding particularly. Um, so this did me, so this meant, um, 
that we started working with our members to identify case studies. We briefed decision makers based on this insight. Um, we worked with The Guardian on a video um, for their Anywhere But Westminster video series. Uh, we carried on advocating for those isolating and um, we built this platform, Our COVID Voices, which I'll tell you more about on the next slide. Um, Our COVID Voices was launched in May and we began collecting these experiences to make sure that we were capturing a first draft of history that included those who live with or care for someone with ill health and disability. But we also wanted to use this in combination with what we were hearing from our member charities in our influencing. We could use these stories to share the perspective of those being most impacted by policies like shielding. So far we've had over 70 stories and, and produced six video accounts which you can find on our YouTube channel so if you just search National Voices on YouTube they'll come up. Um, on the next slide I've got a few quotes from some of our submissions. Um, we found um, in kind of in talking to policymakers, it's been really helpful being able to draw on these real life experiences and when we produced briefings or um, we went to a health and social care select committee, being able to use these quotes was really powerful in communicating um, how, how lockdown was really impacting on people's lives. Um, we heard from people experiencing a wide range of health conditions and life circumstances, people with learning disabilities, carers, uh, people shielding, uh, people who are blind or deaf, who have uh, mental health conditions, who, you know, are caring for children. Um, we heard from the son of uh, someone who was experiencing domestic abuse. There was all sorts in there. We also heard about um, the kind of impacts we heard about pe people talked about you know employment their access to food um, their access to the outdoors um, impacts on their relationships um, particularly in um, caring dynamics and um, their access to support and care where that's been put on hold or they haven't been able to access the same kind of resources they could before we've heard a lot of stories about you know people being really resilient actually and stories of um, community and um, uh, and you know using charities where they haven't before um, and we also heard from people who found lockdown improved their lives and gave them access to the rest of the world that they didn't have before you know suddenly the world was coming to them and everyone was experiencing maybe what they'd been experiencing for a long time mm. so there was a, a really wide range and that's what we a lot of what we found is that people want options and knowledge and information and I'll come to that in a moment. Um, so as well as uh, gathering these stories on our COVID voices we also brought together 30 people that wrote stories for us on a Zoom call to have a discussion about their experiences. So from this and everything we've learned over this time um, we, I've identified kind of seven themes which are on the next slide. Um, so I'll just go through these briefly because I know I don't have that much time. So Firstly, there was a need for better inclusion of various conditions and communities. So there was a big concern that although there was a group of people who received letters and were told to self-isolate, there were whole other groups of people vulnerable in other ways that weren't included. And that produced a lot of fear and anxiety, whether it was people who had other conditions which made them vulnerable, maybe who were disabled, um, or whether it was you know people with difficult living situations who are experiencing domestic abuse or don't have access to the outdoors or there was just a really wide variety or there were people that talked about you know um there was someone who was blind who talked about uh, not being able to access shops in the same way because of the queuing and um the, the way that kind of stuff had changed the second thing was around information and the fact that there was a real need for information to be accessible, accurate and consistent and it really wasn't there for a lot of people over the whole course of lockdown. Um, people were confused um, and I think that's why a lot of people then reached out to charities and charities became you know that trusted place especially to give personalized information and what we found was that what people really wanted was information specific to them and their circumstances. The third thing was um, effects on people's health and well-being 
uh, outside of coronavirus, so effects on their mental health, um, effects on their physical health, health, especially if their treatment has been paused or changed in some way, and the way those two things feed into each other, you know, um, your mental and physical health are really closely intertwined, and National Voices is actually doing another project at the moment that is on that relationship between um, mental health and physical health um, in, in treatment. So the fourth thing was um, that everyone kind of felt like there was a responsibility for everyone to um, help keep people safe through a national effort and that the narrative around that has changed over the last kind of month as we've been coming out of lockdown and that there's a feeling especially among people shielding or more vulnerable that there is no longer that um, social pressure to kind of do it for the people who are vulnerable um, and, and the focus has kind of shifted but that, that, that narrative was really important that we were all in this together and we all had a responsibility to keep each other safe and all of our decisions it impacted upon each other. Um, the fifth thing was the need for ongoing support and this is especially coming out of lockdown, the need um, to not just suddenly be left without anything especially you know with the furlough scheme ending there are still people that might not want to go back to work so that definitely came up and following on from the idea that people want personalized communication was that people wanted to be able to weigh up their risk themselves and that meant being able to have a conversation where they were given the information so that they could weigh up their options they could weigh up whether they want to go back to work they could weigh up whether they wanted to see their their grandkids or their grandparents you know whether they wanted to go outside and do the shopping because that was really important to them um, and the last thing was that it's so important that people take that people are heard and that people with the lived experience are listened to and before decisions are made they're reached out to um, and I think people through this time and it, I suppose it is because everything happened so quickly but the people we spoke to didn't feel like their needs were being considered um, and often felt like an afterthought so based off these themes we developed five principles to, to underpin and test any policy change and they're meant to put people and their rights at the center so these were actively engaged with those most impacted make everyone matter to confront inequality head on and to recognize people and not categories and lastly to value health care and support equally i think we've seen more than ever at this time the importance of um, charity and social care. Um, so that's everything from me. The last thing I wanted to say was that we are still welcoming contributions to our COVID voices online, particularly about your experience of lockdown being lifted and your feelings about the future. Um, so if you would like to contribute, just search our, our COVID voices and you'll find you'll find it. Um, you can also follow us on Twitter at nvtweeting and sign up to our newsletter. Um, you can just email me at um, it's info at nationalvoices.org.uk if you have any questions about anything I've talked about. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Ella. And it, it's great to hear how yeah the, the experiences of the of, of various communities are, are very are very similar. As you say, it's, it's about the person, not groups of people. Um, so we had a couple of questions coming in um, before the, the session started. Um, one of them was kind of for all of you, I guess, um, as someone living with limb girdle muscular dystrophy, um, although I imagine that this could be for, for, for any neuromuscular condition, what's the most important piece of advice or possibly two pieces of advice that I should follow when going out um, about my daily life in order to keep myself safe? So, um, Sue, you're at the centre of my screen, so I'll, I'm going to go to you first. OK, well, obviously, everybody's an individual, so it's hard to give generic advice without knowing all the details. But I think one of the things that we have found um, in both children's and adult services is 
because of the shutdown services um, and the shrinking in services, things like um, the normal physical management programs, the physiotherapy programs, the stretches, the hydrotherapy, um, all those types of things which are so important um, for our patients to, to, to help in that holistic care. Um, those are the things that have, 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 have been missing and, 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 and have not been provided. And also with shielding and limited um, ability to be physically active, many people without gardens not able to, to, to do the, the same level of mobility, however they're mobilizing and at whatever level that's been limited so we we've been coming across now lots of people that are basically deconditioned um and and, and that that so so something about your own individual physical management program and and how to to build that stamina up whatever level of function you're at um and 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 doing that slowly um but being prepared to do that and if if you are linked in with a service and you've got um, access to a physiotherapist uh, via video link or via telephone so, you know talking that through what does it mean for me and how can I start you know that programming because lots of people you know are deconditioned now and we know that that many of our conditions we need to keep moving we need to keep mobilizing we need to stop that those contractures developing um and you know the pain that and discomfort that can come with them so that would be my that would i think my focus that we're we're learning and, and the effect that this this um the lockdown shielding um, has had on people and we're seeing issues there so that would be sort of my sort of focus to think about that Brilliant, thank you. Rob, did, do you want to add anything? Yeah, I think, yeah, to build on, on what Sue just said, but also to sort of bring in something, a, a point that Ella made, which I thought was really important at the end, was it's, like, it's been fascinating as we've been involved in the sort of cross-government workshops on shielding about the, the language shifting towards um, an individual assessment of risk and kind of a, a kind of retro retrospective, it felt like, emphasis on the fact that all oh, shielding was only ever guidance. It wasn't, it was never mandatory. It's up to you. So I think sort of... <clears throat> And two things I would say would, would to yeah would repeat what Susan about in terms of your individual risk definitely speak to your clinicians who know who know you best and and can assess that. But really, um, you know, talk to talk to your clinicians and, and just make a just think about kind of if you follow the precautions in your clinician that doesn't advise you to sort of stay in lockdown. Think about what level of risk you are happy to take and kind of the benefit of of reengaging more with with friends, family, and other, and other networks and, and getting out. I think is key. But I it, I think. As we move ahead, organisations like MD UK are going to have to be thinking a lot about how do we support people to make that assessment. As, as definitely, there is a narrative that it's all down to you to make the individual choices from from now on as as we navigate the new the new normal. To use that phrase for a second time in this in this um, in this panel. Thank you, um, Ella. I see you nodding. Do you do you want to add anything to that? I mean, I just completely agree, and I think as um that it's not an even trajectory out of coronavirus now. And so not only will there be a conversation about risk, but that will be an ongoing conversation. And at different times, you might feel differently. And the important thing, I think, is that we all have the information we need to, to make that choice. Um, so that's specific to your area, specific to your condition, all of these things. Um, yeah, and I think that will be very different to what it looked like when we were in lockdown and we all were following these kind of blanket rules. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, super. Thank you. Um, Jayton, do you want to, to add anything? No, uh, well, only uh, information, isn't it? Information is the key here, is, yeah. is educate and think. And, uh, you know, probably some, you know, with neuromuscular conditions or health conditions, you've been, you, you, are experienced and have the ability to weigh up uh, information, medical information, complex medical information, and uh, and apply it because you've been doing it the whole mm. time. You know, you are doing it all the time and making mm. decisions about your health and, and treatment. So you do have the ability. Um, actually, none of us really know the answer to that question about what any other person should do. Um, and I think it's, it's information is the key. Yeah. Knowledge and, uh, you know, empower yourself with it. And support from your community. There are a lot of people out there, you know, so don't be afraid to uh, to kind of use that and speak yeah. to people. I would say. Yeah. Brilliant, thank you. And, and Chloe, I don't know if you've got any, any thoughts. 
kind of thinking if you're coming out of shielding and you want to be spending time with people and doing things in a safe way I think it's actually not being afraid to tell people no you don't want to do that because I've had so many friends contact me saying right should we go to this place now or do you want to go to, to Nando's and I've gone actually I really don't feel comfortable with that yeah. and saying that made me feel uncomfortable which is not like me normally it's like what well, Nando's I'll be there but in this time in this situation actually the friends who have supported you through lockdown will understand that so if you're saying, well, actually, maybe we could go to the park or maybe if the weather's nice, we can go in the garden. I know it's weather dependent, but it's finding those ways around the circumstance so you can still do things and be out of your property while you can, because who knows when that might change. Yeah. But it's knowing that actually, if you don't feel comfortable with it, don't feel like you have to. Just because we've got these shielding lanyards available to you, it doesn't mean that that suddenly gives you that shield around you, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. It's just to help that. And if you don't feel up to it, just say, no, I have numerous times and I've been really lucky that people understand it. Yeah, yeah, good. Actually, on that, don't, don't go mute just yet. Um, on that, there was a question about the, the lanyards. I mean, you said, obviously, um, you're worried about people coming too close. Do people still have to come very close to read the 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 lanyard or the, the the badge or whatever it might be? I mean, you're still finding that they're coming in with their within the, the two meter zone. Um, no, I haven't. So I made it quite public that I was going to have these on me. So anyone who knows me who would approach me is aware of it already. So just by me saying I have this, this is what it means. It already the people who I would see who would approach me knew. I've put the big A4 one on the back of my chair. So if you come up behind me, you can't miss it. Like it's it plastered this wide across the back of my wheelchair. The one on the lanyard is, is, is fairly big. Like, again, like I've had mine here so you can see it. It's not small writing. It, it's there and it's on, I put mine on a bright lanyard so it's, it's, people can see it and they know it means something. I think maybe, and what I was hoping there might have been was more around it in terms of the general public knowing what these are. Mm -hmm. So the government have actually done their own equivalent now, weeks later, but it doesn't look like something I'd want to print off, like knowing these designs. And I know it's not about it being pretty, but if you're going to be wearing it out and about, you you know, you want to be, feel comfortable wearing it. But even though they've done a national one, I've not heard a thing about it. I only know because of what we've been doing. So I think that's more the issue with it. It's not that people are going to come up and read it because you can see it, but nationwide, nobody knows that these things are available. And I know we're not the only ones to have done them. Sure, sure. No, no, absolutely. It's a very good point. Thank you. There's another question here about um, the research into vaccines. It's a very interesting one. You know, is anyone looking at how specific vaccines might affect different kinds of muscular dystrophy? You know, if people are going to be concerned about um, accepting a vaccine as and when it comes to the fore. I mean, at the moment, obviously, try, it's only we're at trial stage with, with all of them. There isn't anything that's proven um, effective. But Rob, I don't know if you've got any thoughts on that. Yeah, that question was, I thought was a really interesting question and, and it really made me re reflect sort of quickly as, as I saw it, that how rapidly things are moving. So certainly kind of, you know, I've, I've always sort of been quite, skeptical about how quickly there would be a vaccine and I've certainly never in terms of how I process being in lockdown with my family and and, and the, the new normal I, I certainly haven't thought oh there'll be a vaccine by Christmas and yet on the, on the radio this morning there was someone you know, an expert very sort of saying well yeah no it's, it, there might be one by, before this Christmas the government's right to talk about next year but, but so it does it does appear that it's becoming more reality and I think kind of as we move forward it's things like that that charities like MDK are going to have to adjust what we focus on so we may move from the direct support to having to kind of then actually be um, influencing on that kind of question. I think there's two key things for me something Jason said that really stood out was you know, not letting people get left behind again so kind of if there is a vaccine not ignoring that issue or are there going to be groups that it, we don't know if it's safe for yet because we've rushed to get it out to kind of um, the majority. I think a, a real theme that came through the helpline from ours was that it was very unhelpful and the government kept emphasizing or just general people kept emphasizing the media or oh, this will only affect a small number of people but if you're in that small number that, that that's a particularly unhelpful thing to say and then i think the final thing i've said this is i think that's where our our links with the research community coming really really will become really important so as as, as a vaccine becomes a reality um you know use, using our um, dialogue with researchers to to ensure that studies are taking place and I, I know there's a number of studies that we've been asked to promote already simply by the impact of, of COVID on people living with neuromuscular conditions to try and gather the medical evidence where where there have been people with cases. 
fantastic thank you um so there's i'm, I'm very mindful of time that we're we're minutes to four o'clock but there is a question here about where do people go to get a, um, access to i guess what can be trusted information to help people manage the risks and make those decisions for themselves because we see you've got to be sure that you've got the right information to hand to help you make those those assessments so Jotin, i don't know whether you've got any thoughts on on that at all as to where you know where people could go i suppose my first thought would be uh, my medical team right uh, the neuromuscular team as well as gp uh, those would be the first places i'd be thinking about going um uh, and i guess uh, you guys the charities who, who uh, might be able to give us uh, more information um I get it. those would be my trusted uh, sources but you know again with all this information I mean anything that you read uh, online and so on you just got to be very uh, cautious about stuff don't you and, and double check and uh, references and so on if you're reading if you're reading stuff online but my yes in terms of the experts it would be the same experts it's always been right uh, the medical team the GP and uh, charities if they're if they're good charities like you guys uh, i don't know how many others i mean i don't know who else is offering help out there in, in these situations and whether there's been an upsurge of different organizations i'm not i haven't looked into that um, i mean are there lots of people claiming to give advice uh, um i don't think so but i think i suppose that there is just so much information out there on all various different channels social media all sorts of places where people might just find that there's contradictory Things. and so where, where do you go to kind of feel actually that's that's the bit of advice I want to I want to believe and, and take with me and hold hold close I mean Sue I don't know whether people have been kind of reaching out to you as well for, for that um yes and, and I think we've seen definitely that was a big role of the neuromuscular team and and in the early days um you know we had lots of um, phone calls and emails um, and inquiries as there was so much uncertainty and so much information, misinformation, and it was changing so quickly. Um, so yeah, that is certainly still and remains part of our role. Um, we had to look at how we could manage that because actually it was becoming, um, you know, we were getting so many inquiries. So we set up a team email with some responses on that that would automatically point people, um, give people information, but also point them to trusted sites. Um, and MD UK and, and I emailed Rob in the early days, we put you up there because the information that was coming from MD UK, um, you know, it was just, we were able to point people to that. Um, and and, and um, that was really reassuring for us as a health care team as well and some of our other allied charities that we we, we trust um, but yes i mean that that is that is a, a huge role of, of of your health team that work with you and um, because they know you individually know the condition and then working out so having some of those you know communications having those chats about well what do you think because everybody's circumstances are slightly different um, so uh, so yes definitely uh, we would see that as part of the role Brilliant, super, thank you. Well, we have actually, we could go on all afternoon, I'm sure, but we have actually unfortunately reached the end of our, our session. So thank you to all of our speakers. Thank you to everyone who's asked questions and apologies if we haven't reached yours, but we will, we will try and respond to any questions and do drop a note to the info line if there's anything that kind of comes to mind um, later that you want to raise with us or things that you think we should be doing um, we, we would love to hear from you we, we always want we always like to hear from you all um, the session as i mentioned earlier will be uh, available online hopefully within about 24 hours from now um, and we will also be in touch to get some feedback from you so that um, we can make sure that these sessions are as, as useful and as important um, helpful as they possibly can be so really just leaves me um, to say thank you so much to the panel for, for spend, spending the time with us and, and being so open with us and thank you all for um, your participation this afternoon and stay safe and um, we'll, we'll see you again soon in person I hope. Take care everyone and thank you. Bye-bye.